Oh. <clears throat> Good evening. I, uh, I have had a haircut since last time, so I look like a human being again and not some kind of what what is it, like flint like a member of the Flintstones or something. I don't know, like unkempt. What am I saying? So <clears throat> I really enjoyed doing the refactoring stuff on stream last time, so I'm gonna do it again. And this time, the problem is something to do with a game called Yahtzee, or Yahtzee, or Yahtzee, which I've never played. I have heard of it, I've seen it being played in films, I have no idea what the rules are. Hope you're having a good day. Thank you, Avocado Brave. Hope you're having a good day as well. How are you doing? How's life? How did you find me? <laughs> Not that I was trying to hide. So yeah, Yahtzee, dice game. Um, <clears throat> I had a little read through the rules that they they put up here. I have like a rough idea of what's going on. I don't have a solid idea of it, but I think the code should hopefully speak roughly for itself. Odin Project, cool. Are you doing the Odin Project? Are you kind of working through the curriculum right now? And how's the audio as well? I always worry about that when I go live because I can't really hear myself. I, all I have to indicate whether things are okay is the little audio indicator in OBS, which seems fine. So, <clears throat> the first thing I notice about this code is there's a lot of red underlines. Starting the final JavaScript. Fantastic. How have you found it so far? Has it been more challenging than you thought? Less challenging than you thought? Is it taking you longer than you hoped? Less than you hoped? So how I'm going to start is by first creating an nvrc and say python, it's not python, it's pym, and get us a virtual environment going, then I will black, uh, get some linters that I know that I need. Far more challenging but a rewarding experience. Yeah. Um, wait a second. Why isn't chat showing up? Excuse me. Say, sorry, say something. Actually, I'll say something. It's fine. Okay, so this is how it's meant to appear. I'm gonna have chat in here, so if I do decide to like upload to YouTube, it's not just me talking to myself. People can see that, you know, I was talking to people in chat and not just sat here chatting to myself for an hour and a half. Thank you, great. <coughs> Excuse me, right, so. Uh, get my various linters and stuff. Uh, also need PyTest, run the tests, and then I'm going to run PyTest. All 15 tests pass. This is a great start. Uh, however, this is all uh, uh, kind of icky. If I save it, do I get rid of some of the some of the lines? I do. Wonderful. The auto formatting just took care of everything that something was upset with. And I can breathe. Yahtzee. Right. So. Let's have a read through and understand what's going on in here. <coughs> Excuse me. So we have a bunch of the different scoring methods in here. I don't see any like main kind of method. Uh, did I see it at the bottom? No. Top? No. In other refactoring stuff that I've done, it's been like a little program that had a main, like a kind of an entry point where stuff happened. It looks like this one kind of doesn't. This one just has tests, which also have lots of red. I'm also going to add this to my dictionary so it doesn't keep telling me about it. Thank you for the follow, by the way. I haven't, um, I've said this for like four streams in a row now, but 
uh, I haven't set my alerts back up. So when I when I used to stream on a more regular basis, I was doing it from a Windows PC. I have since invested in a Mac, and I just haven't got around to setting things up the way they were. I uh, I find if there's like a high enough bar, like a high enough barrier to to hitting go live, I just don't do it. So um, I'm trying to get better at just going live and not worrying too much about the consequences or like, you know uh, any of the kind of polish that isn't really that necessary like i see that people follow i can say thank you i don't need little alerts for it necessarily but i'll eventually get around to it what was um what's your motivation for odin as well by the way out of interest is it like a career switch kind of thing or is it are you just interested in the industry and how things work this is also kind of funny i do my assertions the other way around uh, I say assert that my code equal to some static value normally like I I don't think there's a correct way of doing it it's just interesting to know that it's not so this is this is more the way that I would do it and it's it's very it's actually kind of strange for me to see both ways in the same testing file it doesn't make a difference it's largely irrelevant but it's uh the first thing I know just looking at that so this just seems to be it's just testing each of the scoring methods right like it's a uh, it's not running like a game of yahtzee career start test does look strange as it so not a career switch so does that mean you're like studying and then odin project is like supplementing your study like i i apologize if i, if I come across nosy i just find people very interesting especially like uh People who kind of get into this career, it's um, instantly something in common with someone else, right? So this looks relatively straightforward. We've got a bunch of what we call pure functions. Um, each of these functions takes an input, then deterministically returns an output. And it seems, honestly, not bad. Like, some of the code we've done refactoring challenges not challenges like refactoring practice on has been god awful like genuinely terrible these aren't that bad as far as i can see <clears throat> there's probably some some work to be done in here though uh, i'll start at the top of the simple ones uh See, honestly, like, this is an entirely reasonable way to implement this. Uh, like, you could, you could do it a different way. So let's say, uh, you could do this. Uh, I'm also going to type things. And then you could... I'm trying to think of a way of doing this is not like way too clever, but is concise. Had to drop ecology to reasons, so I'm going through the Odin project for what I'll do next. Nice. I uh, <clears throat> I think it's a it's a great career to get into. It's a, it it could be a really tough career to get into, but it's a good career to get into. Like there's a ton of prospects in the career. When I say the career, talking about like becoming a programmer and like regardless of what that is. So you could go into data or mobile development or web development or other stuff. There's like a whole bunch of different kind of fields that programming applies to. And you have, like, you, it's a very high skilled job. It's a very in-demand job. It's also like becoming applicable basically everywhere. Everywhere uses technology in some way, shape or form. So like knowing how to master technology and make it do the things you want it to do is just become more and more valuable every year. <clears throat> so what I was thinking was something along these lines. There's a nicer way of doing this. Like 
this. Uh, it's a little shorter. It's a little more dry, people would say. I don't think it's much better. I think it's... Actually, no, okay, hold on. Hold on. What if... Uh, what if... <coughs> what if we say... Something like this, and then we have something we can reuse. Uh, I'm I'm sure there's going to be like a comprehension way of doing it, where we say num for for die in dice if die equal equal num. And can we then sum it? Like, is this a thing? So if I, for example, said Python, uh, and then one, two, two, three, four, and then I copied this, and I say num is equal to, this should return four, and it does. So we can reuse this in a bunch of places. So if I said, and then D1, D2, D3, D4, D5, and then we can do that. Um, but it's actually, oh, uh, how do I call this? Yeah. It's C dot nums. Is that legit? <clears throat> so you see the idea here? So um the idea is we're always asserting that there are five dice. <clears throat> Excuse me. And then we're basically saying count all of the ones of these dice. And we kind of we can then as well as having ones, we can say twos in much the same way. and threes and fours and fives and so on and so forth and that kind of reduces the kind of repetitiveness of the code do we have threes and fours is that like a thing no it's just ones and twos either way this code this should still in theory pass and it does what if i intentionally broke it just uh yeah okay so we got the tests are running and that's all good um, so that cuts some of the code down i think i will go down this route a little less visual noise So, we can do something very similar here, where we say dice, turns it in, and then we can literally just say some of the dice, and I think that's fine, it is fine. So Yahtzee is, so we create counts, which is this one extra to the dice? Oh, this is just seeing if they're all the same. <coughs> and if they are all the same, we give 50 points, and if they're not, we don't. So the way that we can make, kind of phrase this is by saying all
Oh, does, is that not like a... Oh no, I can, all I can do is say, um, die equal equal die is zero, four die in dice. And then I can say if, so I can say return 50 if all the dice are equal to the first dice. Otherwise, return zero. Things still pass. <coughs> Excuse me. How does OOP and Ruby differ from that of Python? Uh, <clears throat> conceptually, it doesn't. It's it's still the same. Like you think about, you have classes, and from classes you can make objects, and they've got properties and methods and stuff like that. All of these things are in both languages. <clears throat> so where we say, you know, class Yahtzee here in Ruby, it would be the same class something. It's just you don't have the semicolon. And then methods very similar between the two of them. Um, there are some differences. So Python has this idea of decorators, which is not a thing in Ruby. Slightly out of scope to talk about decorators, but you, they're basically things that can alter the way functions work. And it just doesn't exist in Ruby. <clears throat> I wish it did. I kind of wish it existed in all languages. It's extremely useful. Um, you, you basically, it allows you to wrap a function in another function. So you can run code before and after a function, but like in the generic way. So uh, one of the interesting applications of that is um, caching. So like uh, if I were to write, say, a function that takes an input and it spits out an output. Uh, but this is very expensive, so that's just like, say, simulate this takes 10 seconds whenever you do it and it returns some value. You, like, every time you call this, you're doing some expensive calculation. You, if you whack LRU cache on there, the first time it computes the value, it saves it, so the next time you call a function with the same argument, that's cached and it's returned instantly rather than having to do the heavy calculation again, just by adding this one line that's part of the standard library. And uh, this has a bunch of like nice um, kind of parameters you can pass in, so max size, so I can say don't cache more than 16 values, so when, <coughs> excuse me, when we go to save the 17th value, the least recently accessed value gets pushed out of the cache. So your cache has got a finite size, which is a very, very nice property to have in like production environments. And then on the other side of that, Ruby's got, uh, what has Ruby got? <coughs> uh, Ruby does a whole bunch of stuff in mix-ins, although Python has mix-ins as well. Uh, I'm trying to think of something Ruby has that Python doesn't. I'm kind of struggling a little bit. Ruby's um, blocks, the concept of blocks in Ruby are not perfectly represented in Python. The the way that you can like, <coughs> you can set the scope of a block and you can um, modify the environment in which a block runs is something that's not, present in the same way in Python and it doesn't have the same niceness of syntax at all like uh, if I was gonna say uh, write a function in Python that takes a function uh, the way you would call that in line is to say like like that's the syntax for doing an inline anonymous function uh, whereas in Ruby you could do the really what I think is quite a lot nicer block syntax and uh, accomplish the same thing, but in what I think is a much nicer way. So in short, it's mostly syntactic differences. Most of the kind of logical concepts are the same. Does that answer your question? Here's the threes and the fours.
Wait a second. Wait a second. Ah! Where did my editor go? There we go. I'm back. Why is threes... Oh, the threes is the same. Fours? Oh, interesting. Hmm. Yeah, the keywords are a bit similar. Def is the same, for example. Class, that kind of stuff is the same. <coughs> Have you done any Python? Um, is any of this standing out as particularly confusing? I can do threes the same way. Uh, nicer and then I can also say five Everything should still pass. And it does. And then, oh, six is the exact same. And then I'm just going to group all of these together. I typically like to structure my code such that you can read top to bottom, and as you read, everything that is dependent on stuff near the bottom has been defined at the top. So you can kind of read it top to bottom and the concepts are introduced in the same order that you're reading. Um, so you don't need to know anything about Yahtzee to understand what this does or what this does. And then we introduce this nums function that's then used here. So everything's introduced in a logical order. And it's a little human thing that I think makes it nicer for people to read your code that I think some people kind of forget sometimes, and it's, it's a little human touch that I think is important. Uh, right, so we've, I think we've done a pretty good job so far uh, slashing this down a bit. How big is the original? So we've, so 230, we're down to like 165, and I think we've we've increased readability so far. What does static method mean? Uh, it it kind of means what you think it means. So if you do you understand the concept of static methods and non-static methods, or is that new? Because I can explain if it's new. And when I ask that, I'm like generally like a static method isn't a Python thing. It's a more kind of broad programming thing. gonna google it ah i got you so you see how uh so fours for example has the self keyword this is something that, again this is not something you'll find in ruby but it's something you'll find quite a lot in python this is defining what's called an instance method or a non-static method so it's a method that operates on an instance of a class and instances, again, the same in all OOP languages, you have this idea of classes and then instances of the class. So if I, so let's do a more kind of cut down example and say class avocado. Uh, and then we'll say, so this is the constructor. So Ruby's got constructors, but they call it the initialize method. It's just underscore, underscore, init, underscore, underscore is the Python equivalent. Um, and we say ripeness and we'll store that 
in here. And we can't say that it's an int. So then we can say, you know, a equals avocado, uh, and its ripeness is say five. Say it's, let's say it's out of ten. Use JS. Okay, in JS, JS is a little different. Um, I'm not a hundred percent sure how this will translate to JS, but feel free to ask questions as I go along if things aren't making sense. So then let's say we make another avocado and we'll call it B. And this is like fully ripe. Like it's completely perfectly ripe. Um, so we now have two instances of the one class. They're not the same. So the ripeness here that we've set um, is individual to each avocado. So A dot ripeness will equal five and then uh, B ripeness will equal 10. So we have two kind of copies of this avocado with different properties inside of them. Um, what we can do from here is to say, uh, you know, is ripe enough? And we'll make it an instance method that returns a boolean. And we will say if, actually no, we'll say return self dot ripeness greater than five. So it needs to be like more than half ripe, whatever that means, for us to consider it being ripe enough. And we can now say things like, you know, if A is ripe enough, you know, eat it or whatever. And it will return true for B, but it will turn false for A right now because A is only five ripeness and it's not enough. Um, <clears throat> So those, that, those are non-static methods because those are methods that have access to the properties and attributes of each individual instance. Static methods don't. So static methods are methods that belong to the class. So I could say um, static method uh, should you buy an avocado. which returns, let's say, a boolean. And it just returns true for the time being. So this method isn't tied to any specific instance. Uh, it, it belongs to the class. So you would normally then say avocado dot, should you buy an avocado? And then no individual instance can, like no individual instance owns that method. No individual instance data is accessible to the method. It's just accessible to the class. <clears throat> it's very strange that ones, twos, and threes are static methods, and then fours, fives, and sixes are instance methods. Like this, if I was doing a code review and a colleague was presenting this to me as code to put into production, I would push it back. I'd say, pick one, you know, pick one of these and go with it. Don't mix and match. Like, this doesn't make sense to have ones, twos, and threes as static, and then fours, fives, and sixes are non-static. It's just very strange. Um, and like, while there's nothing inherently wrong with doing it, like, yeah, okay, you can write code that works. Everyone else who comes across here and sees this is gonna think, why? Why is it written like this? It doesn't make sense. Lowering the, the number of times your colleagues have to ask you why is a really good sort of rule of thumb or litmus test, whatever you wanna say. Does that help? this work <clears throat> so we create six counts okay we're counting each of the dice numbers so we take the value of the dice we subtract one because programming goes from zero to five rather than one to six yeah, um, JS has something similar as well. well. Yeah, it doesn't surprise me. JS is a little different. Like, JS isn't strictly, like, pure OOP. Or, like, it does have objects. It's... But it, it has a different kind of style of inheritance. Like, it's what's called prototypical inheritance rather than... Uh, what do they call it otherwise? Like, polymorphic inheritance? I don't know. 
Um, but there's kind of a more like vanilla inheritance versus whatever it is that JS does. And JS is... I think as time has gone on, like, the different revisions of, like, ECMAScript standards have made the object orientation story of JavaScript closer and closer to what people expect from other OOP languages. And I think that's fundamentally a good idea. Like, keeping it familiar for people is good. It helps adoption. It helps people not trip up as often. Um, yeah, like, introducing the class keyword was a really good idea, in my opinion. Uh, so this counts all the counts. Uh, and then it's saying... Oh, right, okay. If there are pairs, then you... Okay. Okay, so, yeah, counting pairs and then adding the pair values onto the total. This isn't a horrific way of doing it. I'm trying to, when I'm, like, for each of these, I'm trying to think of, like, what is a concise but easy to understand way of doing this? Like, how can I make this bite size but not confusing because right now this is confusing and it's like it's kind of bite size but it's confusing like having to think about these indices is strange very like as i read through i'm trying to verify with myself like yeah i think this works correctly like the, the tests tell us that it does work correctly but like reading through it it takes oh easy takes a minute to convince myself that it's doing the right thing which is not good it's not like a quality you want for your code you want to you, you want your code to be at a glance easy to see that it does the right thing so how would we do that with pairs uh, so there is a python built-in thing uh, There is a thing called a counter. So this is probably cheating. Uh, but you can say... And then... I can't remember exactly what it gives you. Uh... Uh, yeah, yeah, I know, I know, I know, relax. Um, so, if I said... This one counter wrong. Counter this. What is in the iterator? Oh, there isn't one. Yeah, okay. So I get the key and the value. Okay, right. So what I would say if I was doing this for real is say for num count in So I think there's some further simplification we could do here. Turn the total. This is this is probably gonna count as cheating for the purposes. Oh, it's also wrong. <gasps> oh wait, 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 wait. Yes, that's right. Num count in count. Not that, is it? No. Wait, oh. Huh. It's funny. Have I misunderstood? Uh... Oh, interesting. Hold on. Oh, is it only the 
biggest path? I think it is. I think it's only the largest path. Did the previous code do that? Ah, it returns, it iterates it backwards. That's clever. Okay, so how do we do that? Uh, hmm. Can I say Yeah, I can. Nice. Um So <clears throat> As a Vim user, do you think it has any advantage for beginners? Uh, everyone seems to talk about the speed you have text editing. What does that have for a beginner? I use Vim, but I think I was sold on a fake promise. Um it's a weird one. I I think it's worth learning. I don't think it's this nirvana of productivity that it is made out to be. I've heard people say things like, you know, code at the speed of thought and stuff like that. And like, sure, I'm sure if you I'm sure if you invested enough time in any editor's key bindings and idiosyncrasies and stuff like that, you could get very, very quick and close to being able to code as fast as you can think. The relative merits of that are questionable. So Vim, Vim is one of many ways of achieving high productivity. Uh, believing it to be this like one true way or, you know, six vim shortcuts that will make you 10 10 a 10x programmer you know like you, you know programmers hate him and then those kind of like bait headlines it's all bullshit like if you pour time into learning a way of editing you will get better at it and you will become more productive and vim just happens to be one of the ways of doing it and when i was starting out uh, in my career i decided fairly early on i wanted to learn vim it looked very useful I, at that time, was very enamored with the command line and free software and stuff like that. And I, you know, Vim, Vim is it, it sits on this like throne as a piece of software that's been around since way before I was born. And it's something that, like a lot of who the 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 person I was ten years ago is very different to the person I am today. But back then, I would have thought, yeah, you know, like high quality programmers use vim like it's it's this mark of pride i don't think that anymore i i'm glad i learned it and i think if i didn't know it i still would kind of wish i was learning it or had learned it i think it is like a really nice way of editing i wouldn't get too like i'd be i'd caution people about being too oversold on it in much the same way i caution people against things like diet pills or magic beans or you know stuff like that like there's no quick fix it's just it's all a function of learning the tools that you have and picking tools that make sense for the problems you're trying to solve of which i think vim is a good one for programming um, so i'd say stick with it uh over time you will get better and it will feel better to use uh one of the nice things i think about using vim is finding other people that use vim watching them work and watching them move around the code in a way that you don't and learning new ways of moving around as a result which i imagine you've probably noticed like I, I it's almost certain that i move around the code in a way that is different to the way that you do and i can imagine there's things you've seen me do and think well, you know what keys did he press there um so i'm happy to happy to answer questions like that if you have them so let's say dice and then I'll say for I in range six to zero is it six to zero if I did uh, 
Hmm? Oh, I've got to say minus one, have I? Yep. Yeah. Oh, that's correct. Great. Uh, if counter i equal to return i multiplied by 2. And at the very end, we say return 0. And we're back to green. Wunderbar. Is this better? Maybe. Does it lean heavily on the standard library, even though you're probably not meant to? Yes. Could it be improved? Probably. That's probably the way. Something I miss from Ruby a little bit is being able to say I would like that to be valid syntax in Python. I think it's the postfix conditionals are really nice. I miss them. Oh, this is, this is a very interesting, it's very similar. So it's returning the highest two pair. Although if you have two pair, they are the highest two pair, right? Either way, uh, the solution is very similar. I also realize I've forgotten. my int here so now what I want to say is have my total and say total plus equals I multiply by 2 and then I'll copy them and say n and say return 0 if n are equal to else Oh, I, I think I can say this actually, can I? Let's do, uh, total if n is 2 else 0. And that should pass, but it doesn't. Where have I gone wrong? Doesn't immediately look wrong to me. Vivax3794, welcome. First time chat viewer. How's things? I am trying to decipher the game of Yahtzee from a Yahtzee refactoring counter. Because I've never played Yahtzee. I've seen it in films. I've seen people playing it on the screen. Never actually played it myself. It's not really a thing in the UK. Now I think about it. See, now this looks right to me. So lot of static methods. Oh, believe me, they would not be there if it was up to me. Um, it may even be up to me. So, little background. Um, there are, I found out kind of recently, exercises in refactoring where you get some code that is in need of being refactored and you refactor it. This one in particular, um, the it seems like the the plan for this one was there are some tests already and you meant you you meant to make the code as nice as you can without kind of touching the tests so you should i think i may go and touch the test later on you know because we're renegades but the idea is that these tests should always pass and you should just try and make the code as nice as possible ghost rider hey there's hello hey there sam from callus server how are you today i'm very good thank you i recognize you from callus chat How's things? 
Are you still playing Rocket League? I think you are one of the Rocket League gang. You're good, good to hear. Um, Rocket League's been a right. So I, have, I haven't played in so long, you know. Uh, so to carry on answering Vivax's question, the code we got to begin with, very strange. Why do they have a class just starting like this? I know, right? So the ones, the twos. So are you familiar with Yahtzee? You roll dice and you get various type, kind of scores. Um, one of the scoring methods is you count all of the dice of a particular value and you get a score of the sum of the dice in that value. So if you got four ones and a two and you scored for ones, you'd get four, for example. And if you got three twos uh, and you scored for twos, you would get six. Um, yeah, okay, you're going to like my code, at least so far anyway. Um, so the ones, twos and threes are all static methods and then they've got this fours fives and sixes use instance methods with the dice as a property and i was saying earlier to uh to avocado brave who i think is still around um if this was a pr in my organization and i was reviewing it i would kick this back and say choose one of these choose instance methods or static methods don't don't mix them like this yeah it's very strange i completely agree but I'm keeping it as is to make sure the tests still pass because the tests rely on the fact that they are static methods. So I may change it momentarily. For now, though, my two pair is broken. I don't know why. You've got a kicking PC? Uh, what do you mean? How can you tell? It's not even a PC. The specs? How did you see the specs? Oh, in the about thingy. Uh -huh. That's my old PC. <laughs> like, is that a flex? I'm sorry. That's my old PC. <laughs> um, I have, okay. I have upgraded my PC since then. And then the upgraded one I'm not using. Which is a really tragic story. That is, it's a super horrendous flex. And I'm not going to say it. But I, I'm using a Mac at the moment. Oh, my cam froze. This, is, this has been happening recently. Let me see if I, if I turn it off and turn it back on. Give me a moment. No, just my face. Looking great. Uh, what if I... Say... Okay, why do I do this? Okay, you can see you can see my chest and then I go back to the cam link and then I turn my camera back on voila yeah I think it just overheats um, I think because it's kind of warm at the moment in summer in the UK the cam like just freaks out and overheats it's, it's like a DSLR because it looks so much nicer uh, where was I yeah so I think it's, it's it's an old PC I use a Mac now I prefer Mac to Windows for like my day job and stuff like that. Very fancy. Yeah, it does look a lot nicer though. Like it, it picks up the light much nicer and the nice blurring effect in the background. It just it's not even not even my camera. My wife is a or was a photographer, um, but she doesn't do that anymore. Uh, so I just stole one of the cameras and the lenses and started using it as a webcam. Uh, not that I should be complaining. My current project is a direct middle finger to all established good practice. <laughs> yeah. Code, as it ages, cares a lot less about looking good in much the same way that people do. <sighs> communal camera. It's more stolen than communal. So this is returning zero, and it certainly bloody well shouldn't be. If n equals two, turn total. What if I stop being ridiculous and do that instead? No, n, oh, interesting. What if I do that? N, oh, pfft. Uh, n is a PDB command. 
So n is 2 there. Total is 16. 3, 3. Oh, wait, no, this is one of the ones that's going to be fine. Uh, uh, which test is failing? Test two pair. I should have figured that. And the pair in P is an uppercase just to make me feel bad. So N is two. Our dice. Total 16. Yes. So that one, wait, that one passes. What kind of keyboard did you have? Uh, I have an Ergodox. Um, if you're unfamiliar, I have one of these. A long time ago. Way back in like 2017. I had like horrendous wrist pain, like couldn't lift a cup of water or a cup of tea. And as a British person, that's a very essential life skill without experiencing some kind of pain, which was really concerning because I, uh, my wife was pregnant with our first child. My job kind of relies on the ability to type. So I like losing that ability was very concerning. Uh, and I saw a whole bunch of different medical professionals about this. So I saw three different GPs. I had an MRI scan and I spoke to a musculoskeletal specialist, uh, all kinds of different things. Uh, everyone was like, yeah, your, your hands are fine. And I was like, they're not though, like very objectively not fine. Um, but nobody could really figure out exactly why. And then I, because I, I kind of gave up. They all seemed a bit useless. I was like, right, let's just try loads of different things. So I bought loads of different like ergonomic keyboards and mouses and different like pads to put my wrist on and all kinds of different things. And eventually realizing that a split keyboard alleviated my pain very quickly. And I think the way that I type on a non-split keyboard um, puts, so I, I, I hold my hands in this kind of position to type right which puts a ton of stress here because you're essentially holding your hand like at a fairly extreme angle at all times whereas with with split keyboard you, you sort of neutralize that by having your hands further apart so my my wrists are in a pretty neutral position 100 percent of the time and that makes an enormous difference thanks for the follow by the way ghost rider Wondering how they are. I bet you had to reteach. Yeah, so it's rough. The first couple of weeks are rough. Like, my typing speed dropped down to almost zero for the first day. Like, it was so frustrating. Especially because I was trying to relearn with the hand pain. Because you, I kind of couldn't stop in a way. Like, I, I still had to <laughs> feed myself and, and all that kind of stuff. Uh, so it was a real challenge to get myself back up to speed. But I'd say within about two or three weeks, I was up to workable speed. Not where I was, but workable speed. And then since then, because it's been years now that I've been using this, I'm actually, I think, quite a lot faster. What switches are in it? They sound like some sort of blue, if you will. They've got a blue sound to them, but they are Kale Speed Bronze. Um, so they're much lighter than blue switches. And they have a slightly different, like, clicky sound. It's more popcorn-y than, you know, clacky. Um... I want to try those, but I'm also fine with my current keyboard. So, for, yeah, it, it, if your current keyboard is fine, you're not really experiencing problems, and, you got, and you've got no strong motivation for it, they're, they're an expensive hobby. They're a really expensive hobby to get into. Especially anything with ergonomic in the name ends up costing a fortune. Why did that test pass? Oh, that's not what I think. Test to pass. Oh, right, okay, hold on, test, two pass, so this one fails, so if I put a right point here, I pi test, can I, uh, how do I step in? Step, step, okay, so now I'm in two pair, great. Look, thank you very much. 
it was nice to have you drop by. Let's nice have all of you drop by. I appreciate every single person who drops by and has like a chat and hangs out. It's really nice. I love talking about programming. I, I, I talk about programming all day at work. I can talk about programming all day after work. I just really enjoy it. So if we continue step again, so step, step. Oh, bollocks. Up. Oh, thank you. Uh, nope. Next. Next. So this is all fine. I want to see what it gets to. Oh, it fucking went to that. Wait. Oh. Do I still have access to N? I do have access to N. Great. Dice. Oh, okay. Oh, right. So it's technically a full house, but it, it counts. I could have just read the test case. Okay, right. Because I am just looking for equal to. I'm not finding this case, so it should actually just be greater than or equal to two, and then this test should pass. There we go. Cool. Feel good. So now, can we make this a little nicer? We can make it a bit nicer with one of those. We can make it a bit nicer with... Those are fine. This is fine. Like you, you can do this. It's arguable as to whether or not that's you know nicer, but whatever. I think this is completely acceptable as it is. Four of a kind. I am seeing a pattern emerging. So four of a kind would be dice int int uh, like so. Ooh. Ah, I've done it again. I've done it again. Unfucking believable. There we are. Does that mean those are pairs are fine? I think if I if I change this to that, it's still fine. I think that's like technically the correct thing. But I'm seeing a pattern. And the pattern is these are all super similar. I'm going to continue on and do three of a kind, which is just this. And the tests definitely still pass. So this, I think, warrants a little functional decomposition. N of a kind. And that definitely needs snakes, where we say N. This becomes n, and then we can say return Yahtzee n of a kind to dice, and it should still pass. Yep. Uh, then. Um, 
two pair is a touch different. Two pair needs some special handling because we count whether or not we have two of them. So I'll put a optional little quag in here that says say return total if n equals count else zero if not count or zero. That's, that's becoming a little bit of a horrible one-liner. Slayheim, how's it going dude? Long time no see. So that if statement is a bit ass. So we should say if not count or n equals count, return the total, otherwise return zero. I think that's a little easier to understand and wrong as it would happen. Happy to be here, happy to have you here. Oh, you know what's happening? Yeah, no. Hmm. What have I done wrong? What have I done wrong? Ah, no, they are fundamentally different. Okay, hold on. Hmm. Yeah, two pair is just different. How's life going, Sly? How have you been? What are you playing right now? So we got three of a kind, four of a kind, pets, rearrange these. Uh, three of a kind, four of a kind, and two pairs, but different. All of our code still passes. Great. Um, playing God of War and near Automata. God of War is that the one where he's got an axe that you throw and he says boy quite a lot. Final Fantasy fourteen catch on friends. Are they the friends that I have met? Willow at Al. Okay, so straights are, if there's one of each, it's a straight. That's the one, X and the boy. 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 It's kind of an old game now, isn't it? I say old, it's like a few years old. I remember when it came out and I watched, um, so I went through a big phase of watching Christopher Odd on YouTube. He does like playthroughs of games and he played through it and I, I really enjoy his playthroughs they're very re like it's, he's not he's not trying to like make content so he's not like hyper overreacting to everything that happens he's playing he's just playing the games and he's giving his thoughts on the games as he plays through them I really like his videos so we can cheat and say a really nice cheat to this and say oh what 
Oh, 50. Oh, it's, um... Cheating. Uh, small straight and large straight. Why? So what's the difference between a small straight and a large straight? Oh. It's whether or not it ends in six. Whether or not it ends on six. Mm. Um. Mm. Hello. Thank you. I think this is incorrect. Give me a second to think about it. Um, this is not in. Second. It is one. I'm cool it. Hmm. Ooh, we are doing good stuff. So a full house is where you have a two or something and a three or something. Two or something and a three or something. How the cats slay? How how the kitty cat? Do you have two or is it just HP? I can't remember. I hear, sorry, I have a feeling you have two cats. Is that right? Um, okay, again, we can cheat again. There's so much cheating going on. I don't know if using counter is advisable or not, but we can say counter values. I thought you had two. Um, just chillin. Should all be one. Yeah, okay, good. So, what we can say is... I think this returns a... Can I just say slot values and get a list? Yep. Yeah. 
Oh, actually, what? Uh, okay, we need to calculate the score. It's not enough to just say it is or not. It's all they do. It's why I wanted them nice. I remember you were saying that one of them was fairly boisterous and enjoyed chewing on cables and whatnot. So what we'd say is total equals zero. And counts equals this for num count in let's just say counter dice, get rid of that. Total plus equals but it's, it's just the sum of everything in the full house. It's just the sum of everything in the full house. Is it, is it not that? We are code golfing. Yeah, I thought it was. I didn't think I was going crazy. Okay. I think this is nicer. Thing is a lot nicer. All the tests still pass. We've got much more concise code. Vivax, are you still here? What do you think? It almost all fits on one screen. Uh, if I get rid of the assertions, we just assume it's going to be called correctly. We could definitely employ some tricks to make it less lengthy if we wanted to, but I don't think we want to. This stands out as being a unique little snowflake that we can't do much about. But I think everything else, everything else is pretty good. Most of it's one liners or two liners. I'm pretty happy with that. Ooh, I felt good. So we started out with 230 lines. Wasn't expecting that to happen. Moderately shit myself. So we started off with 260 lines of some fairly repetitive and, and, and kind of strange code in places. And I think we've ended up with 83 lines of Nice, concise, still, still, I'd say fairly easy to understand. Far less repetitive code. And it does the exact same thing. Semantically identical. So brilliant. I'm going to call it a night. Are you, uh, are you streaming, Slay? Are you going to be on tonight? I may drop by a little bit. I'm only, I'm, so I'm going to stay up for an extra like hour or so tops. Because uh, I have the kids in the morning. I have uh, the little one is sleeping here. Speaking of chilling out. But I'm up early tomorrow. I'm up in about eight hours' time. So I should go to bed, but I'm not going to. I'm going to stay up a little bit more. I think that maybe energy is low, might just chill. Yeah, no, I feel you. Um, cool. Well, whatever you decide to do. Uh, I hope you're well and that you stay well and that you continue being well into the future. And I don't know when I will next stream. It's all been very sporadic recently. I have several million things 
ongoing at the same time in life and juggling everything is challenging it's all like it's like a, it's a good mix of mostly positive with a couple of negative bits but not too negative the positive stuff like far outweighs it so it's, it's all generally good anyway i'm gonna stop waffling and go and chill out for a little bit before bed love you all and thank you for dropping by